should be working. That's your cue, Bernie. You can start your dance or joke or however you want to start the show. Oh, I have something planned. So yes, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Bernie Petit and I am an education coordinator for the Canadian Light Source. Um, typically I do the indigenous programs, but today I had the, uh, I have the honor of introducing our group, which is the first group that I've ever gotten to lead for students on a Beamline experience. So uh, with that, I do want to also introduce my mentors who are Anna Maria Beckler and Amanda Pfeiffer, because I have big science energy. I need two mentors. And we also have uh, Dr. Gosha Corvus and uh, uh, Gosha is the student's mentors. So today's Student on the Beamline seminar is brought to you by Carleton Comprehensive High School. They're in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. And um, I have a few housekeeping <laughs> items to mention. So one is that yes, we are live streaming on YouTube and this is being recorded. You are uh, more than welcome to keep your videos off if you uh, are so desire. And for those of you that are joining us on Zoom, you have some different viewing options, but you can also pin the speakers if you want to um, see the different students going from screen to screen as well as if you have any questions for the Q&A afterwards, you can either uh, write them or type them in the chat, uh, raise your hand and myself or our, my fellow team members from education, we'll field those questions as well. So I'd like to introduce Carleton High School, uh, uh, Carleton Comprehensive High School, and their presentation is going to be on the declining lake trout population in Kingsmere Lake, Saskatchewan. Take it away, guys. So good afternoon. Thank you again for joining us today. We will be presenting our presentation, our research project on the lake trout decline in Kingsmere Lake. So first, we'd like to acknowledge that the Canadian Light Source, Carleton Comprehensive High School, and the sample collection sites in Prince Albert National Park are located on Treaty 6 territory and in the traditional territories of the Nahiawak, Anishinaabe, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota nations, and the homeland of the Métis. And on the map, you can see Prince Albert. With northern, it is the Prince Albert National Park. And to south, it is Saskatoon. And today, we'll be going through an introduction, a history, and the ideas beamline research, the bio-XAS imaging research, and the conclusion. So who we are, well, we are the science research team from Carleton Comprehensive High School in Prince Albert. We have been working on this project since September 2021 as an extracurricular club. We are in grades nine to 12 and have been working virtually with the CLS staff and scientists for the past four days. Previously, this club also did an in-person research at, in 2019 at the CLS. And today presenting, we have myself, Janelle Scott, and I'm in grade 12. Sanjana, I'm also in grade 12. Nathan, and I'm in grade 10. My name is Lambert, and I'm in grade 9. My name is Jack, I'm in grade 9. My name is Alex, and I'm in grade 12. My name is Madison, and I'm in grade 12. My name is Jessica, and I'm in grade 11. My name is Mary, I'm in grade 11. My name is Arwa, and I'm in grade 9. My name is Ella, and I'm in grade 11. My name is Nevin and I'm in grade 12. Okay, to start, I would just like to talk about a little bit of the history of Kingsmere Lake. So Kingsmere Lake, um, here's a little map of Kingsmere. Um, the lake trout population in Kingsmere, uh, which is located in the Prince Albert National Park, has been declining by 45% since 2009. So um, on this map, you can see obviously Kingsmere, but also the other lakes that we have studied, such as Wasigam, which is north of Kingsmere, Crean Lake, which is um, east of Kingsmere, and then finally Nomigas, which is southeast of Kingsmere. 
So here we have compiled a timeline of all the important events that occurred in Kingsmere that would have affected the trout lake population um, and the overall health of the lake. So the timeline starts in 1913 and goes all the way to 2021, because this is how far our samples um, date back to. So from the 1920s to the 1930s, Kingsmere sustained a fishery. And then from 1930s to um, 1999, um, it was home to like a dam. Um, and some other notable things are that a creel data study um, that indicates fishing in Kingsmere exceeded the maximum sustainable year uh, yield. And this um, study uh, went from 1966 to 1988. Um, and because of that, the park decided to um, decrease the limit on how much trout can be caught. So previously it was um, three trout per uh, person, but uh, then they decreased it to one. And then um, the study we kind of talked about before was the study that occurred from 2009 to 2017, which talked about how um, the lake trout population had declined by 45%. And then finally, um, something else that was noticeable was a lead ban in 1997. So our soil samples, um, we, we received lake bed core samples from Parks Canada, um, and they come from Namikas Lake, Green Lake, and and Kingsmere. They were all collected in 2021 by Parks Canada scientists for their Traces of Trout project. So these samples were collected um, with tubes, as you can see in that picture. Um, and then um, in the tubes, they were like cut into sections, each about um, two centimeters in depth, and they span from two to five years. And you can see each of those sections were then like put in a bag, which that's what the other pictures are for. So the um, the first the the one sample dates all the way back to 1913, and then the most recent one is in 2021. So um, why did Parks Canada choose um, these three lakes? So first, um, it's because Kingsmere um, has a declining lake trout population, um, and then Crean has a remnant lake trout population. So due to like, um, they, they're, and this is due to a previous population crash. And then finally, Namikas currently has no lake trout, but um, First Nation oral history identifies that there was a possible um, past of a lake trout population in that lake. Um, so by comparing the data from Kingsmere and the other two lakes, we can see if there's a possible relation between King Crean, Kingsmere, um, and Namikas regarding the lake trout population decline. We'd also, we we'd also received odalisk samples. And these odalisk samples also came from Parks Canada. Odalisks are small, hard calcium carbonate structures located at the base of the skull in bony fish. When cut in half, you can see the rings of the odalisk and more rings are added as the fish develops. The rings of an odalisk can be compared to the rings of a tree and the rings of an odolith can be counted to determine the age of a fish. As a fish matures and more layers are added to the odolith, elements can become trapped in these layers. This is why we had chosen to use odoliths on the BioXES imaging beamline. If there was contaminants present in the lake, we would see that reflected in the odolith samples. By comparing the odoliths from Kingsmere, the lake with the declining lake trout population, to Odalis from Wasagam, the lake with a stable lake trout population, we could look for differences in the elemental concentrations in the Odalis to see if there's contaminants present in Kingsmere. So based on this information, we thought that by studying the Odalis and core samples obtained from Kingsmere Lake and its neighbors Namikas, Crean, and Wasagam, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, we aim to identify the presence of mercury, cadmium, copper, lead, and zinc to provide direction to further research on lake trout populations. Okay, and moving on to 
ideas. So in our research at the Ideas Beamline, we used XRF and Zane's techniques. We will discuss XRF first. So what is XRF? X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy is a non-destructive analytical procedure that can be used to analyze the elemental makeup of sample materials. When excited by an X-ray source, the fluorescent X-ray discharge from a sample is measured to determine the chemical makeup of the sample. This technology is excellent for material composition analysis. So onto a sample preparation procedure. So once the samples were brought to our school by Parks Canada, we placed soil from each section in a sample carrier provided by CLS. So you can see in the picture, the white plastic rectangle is those sample carriers. So once we had put our soil into these carriers, we secured them with a piece of yellow captain tape as shown in the picture. And then from there, we labeled them with our corresponding lake and depth. And from then on Thursday, May 26th, we ran 54 soil samples on the ideas beam line. Data on the screen is of, a, is of a sample taken from a depth representing Kingsmere Lake in the year 1965. The following elements were found in the analyzation process. Calcium, titanium, chromium, manganese, iron, nickel, copper, zinc, gallium, arsenic, selenium, and bromine. Uh, the data on the screen of, is of a waterfall graph of analyzed Kingsmere core sample data. The presence of elements in every sample is relatively identical, evid and evidently there are no uh, abnormal peaks showcasing the presence of any harmful elements, and there has been no significant change in the detected element types throughout the years. An exception to this is the four centimeter sample, which will be discussed later in the presentation. Shown here are the results from 1913 to 2021 for Crean Lake. Again, it is evident that there are no changes in elemental presence throughout the years. These results belong to Namikas Lake from the years 1913 to 2021. No notable difference in elemental presence is apparent in the data gathered from the mentioned years. Here we arrange the same depths of all three lakes representing the elemental composition from approximately 1921. This waterfall graph demonstrates how the elemental presence in all three lakes is relatively similar and does not showcase any data of particular concern. When we were looking over our data, we had a variety of elements we were specifically looking for. One was lead. In our data, we found a peak at the energy level where lead is supposed to be. However, since the K-alpha peak, which signals arsenic, is at the same energy level as the L-alpha peak, which signals lead, the program identifies this peak as only arsenic. We chose to run further testing on those peaks because it was unclear whether lead was actually present. This is why we use a technique on the ideas beam line and that technique, technique's name is Zane's. The reason we care about lead in the first place is because it is a toxic metal and in large quantities, it can be very harmful to wildlife. And the reason for our concern with lead specifically being in this lake is because lead is used for uh, sinkers for fishing. And so we wondered how that might affect the lake. But since, like we said before, 1997, it has been banned from Kingsmere. So what actually is Zanes? Well, Zanes stands for X-ray absorption near edge spectroscopy. It, uh, it's a more specific data analysis than XRF that we chose to use to because we want to see if lead was actually present. Uh, and like I said, it's a technique on the ideas beamline. If, and how we can actually read the graph is, if there is an edge present, like where my mouse is right now, that indicates that there is a concentration of the element we're looking after. And also how, if the graph is, I guess, spiky, and like really uneven, that indicates a lower concentration of the element. But we 
cannot tell the exact concentration using Zanes. Zanes is important for detecting the presence of elements as it zones into a specific element. And we're able to actually detect or find out the specification of that, of the specific specification of the element. The results from our data using Zane's beam, Zane's technique on the ideas beam line is we were able to find that there was a presence of lead. However, that presence was rel it was that presence has was very consistent throughout all of our samples. So our samples went as far back as like 1917 to present day uh, and uh, actual concentration or like the amounts are, since we cannot tell the actual concentration, it has not differed noticeably from sample to sample. And I'd like to mention that the Zane's, the beamline was calibrated to look for lead. So we, like I just to reinstate, we do not know the exact concentration of the lead, but we know that it is present in our samples. One second, please. And what we can conclude is that there is a presence of lead in the samples. And since the presence was consistent throughout the years, the concentration not drastically differing from sample to sample, the, it was likely not significant to the lake trout population decreasing, likely not. For this reason, further research is not necessarily required. However, since the Zanes and XRF data are unable to tell us a specific amount of lead in the samples, if someone were curious what that amount was or concentration of lead was, whether it was abnormal or not, then further research would be required. So to go back to our XRF results, there was a section mentioned as being slightly abnormal, which was the Kingsmere Lake four centimeter in depth sample from approximately 2009. The graph shown here compares the unusual findings from the four centimeter samples with the surrounding sections. So 2013 and 2017 as shown in the graph. These are all the results from the years of the 45% decline. This is an indication that once again, there are no specific significant abnormalities or any other evidence to specifically suggest or imply a cause of the decline in the lake trout population. The possible explanations for the unusual results are unknown. There will be further testing down at the beam lines. So the first arrow references a possible CCM peak requiring further Zane's research. And the second arrow shows a peak we are not able to identify and it needs further Zanes testing. The team at the CLS is taking a deeper look at this sample, but unfortunately not in time for our presentation. For our XRF studies, we concluded that the XRF data reveals the presence of elements in Kingsmere was, not, was consistent across the years 1913 to 2021. This is also the conclusion drawn for Namikis and Crean Lakes respectively. The data does not allow us to draw conclusions about the relative amount of elements present in any of these samples, only the presence or absence of them. Once again, we did, however, see an anomaly in Kingsmere Lake that will be further researched at the CLS. Um, so now for our findings um, at the BioXAS imaging um, for our otoliths. Um, so firstly, uh, what is BioXAS imaging? Um, so this stands for Biological X-ray Absorption Spectroscopy Imaging, and it is used to detect the relative concentration of um, elements found within biological samples. Um, so this allows us uh, to do further study of the roles of elements uh, within biological processes and in the environment. And to analyze our own data, we use the software PyMCA in order to determine um, the relative concentrations of elements found within our otoliths. Um, so as for our samples, um, six samples were collected by Parks Canada and prepared at CLS by Dr. Gosha Corbis. Um, we had three smaller um, sectioned samples um, that came from Kingsmere. 
and three larger uh, full autolith samples, which came from Wasagam. Um, so we decided to focus on one of our larger samples and um, one of our smaller section samples. So those samples, as you can see on the photo, are samples number one and five. And so we decided to do two samples instead of all of our six samples, because after analyzing um, all of our six samples, we concluded that um, there were no anomalies found in each of the samples. Um, another um, part of our testing process was that we used aluminum foil uh, to dampen um, the concentration of calcium found within these otoliths, since um, the composition the, or the chemical composition of otoliths is um, has a significant amount of calcium. Um, so now for our trout otoliths, here you can see um, two microscopic images of these fish otoliths we chose to do an in-depth analysis on. Um, so one sectioned from uh, Kingsmere and one full otolith from Wasagam. So these pictures can demonstrate the uh, relative size in millimeters. And um, another thing to just be aware of is how Parks Canada did preserve these samples um, and they used resin to encase uh, these otoliths. So trout otoliths are calcium carbonate structures. So we expected to find high amounts of calcium in all of our samples. Um, the lighter and more clear an image is means that there's a higher concentration of any of, of an element and the darker and more pixelated an image is means that there's a lower concentration. And as you can see in both these samples from Wasagam and Kingsmere, they're, they're very bright and very clear, meaning that we found a high amount in each, a high concentration in each. Zinc was another element we expected to find in the otoliths. Um, as you can see in both the Kingsmere and Wasagam samples, there are some brighter areas in the center, meaning that there's a higher concentration, as well as a brighter area along the side of the Kingsmere sample. And that could be a higher concentration, but that could also be due to the reflection from how the beam was set up. And just another thing to note, um, zinc is an element where you are able to see the rings that we had previous, previously mentioned in the otoliths. Another metal of interest in our testing was copper. Copper is essential to the growth of living organisms. However, in high concentrations, it can be toxic. In our scans, we had noticed that copper was present in both otoliths, as you can see in the areas highlighted. The concentrations of copper appeared to be lower than the concentrations of calcium and zinc except in the areas outside of the otolith where concentrations appeared to be high. Because these areas are scattered outside of the otolith, it is most likely a contaminant from the resin the otoliths were encased in, or a contaminant from the methods used to prep the otolith samples. Something that we saw on the graph was a very small peak of chromium. Chromium is a naturally occurring metal in fish. The natural amounts are low as high amounts of chromium can be toxic and or fatal. The concentrations of chromium in the fish were lower than calcium and zinc, but were above the detection limit on the beam line. In conclusion to our time at the BioXAS imaging beamline, we found that there did not appear to be any abnormalities in the concentrations of metals across various testings on the otoliths. The distributions of metal layers on the otoliths also appeared to be consistent. Lastly, for our concluding thoughts. Throughout this project, it became evident that there may be possible human error, specifically in our sample prepping. While preparing the soil samples, there were different students creating the sample holder with the captain tape. This led to the possibility of having larger amounts of soil in each sample. To visualize this, the zoomed in graph shows King's Mirror throughout the years from 1913 to 2021. At this specific peak, it is easy to see that there are different amounts of metals, but the metal is still present in different quantities. Note that the metal is present in all samples, but the amounts are not the same due to the unequal amounts within the sample holder. 
Secondly, to completely fill each sample holder, there, was se there were several samples that were required to be combined with surrounding layers to have enough material in the carrier. Lastly, there is always the possibility of contamination when preparing the soil samples. Our data collected and tested on the IDEAS and BioXAS imaging beamlines is a large indicator in further understanding the lake trout population decline in Kingsmere Lake. Further research may be conducted on the lead that was present in our Kingsmere samples um, in order to, to, to determine the amount of species of lead. Additionally, more research is needed to identify the possible presence of cesium in the Kingsmere 2009 sample. We could have also developed better images of autoliths by analyzing thinner sections using more time and energy and a beam smaller than 20 microns. So to conclude, our research was a large stepping stone for the acquisition of more information regarding the trout population in Kingsmere, Namigas, and Crean Lake. This has the ability to aid our community by furthering research um, on our environment and local national park and its well-being. Lastly, we would like to thank everyone who made this project possible, including especially to those who we have named on the slide. Um, and that is it for our presentation. And we would be delighted to answer any questions that anyone has. So I have a couple of questions if nobody else wants to say anything. Students, are you ready for questions? Yes. Right. Absolutely. Go ahead, Rob. Oh, you could hear me. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, question number one. So you got some samples collected by Parks Canada. Did you ask them if they've been monitoring the water quality in that lake over any length of time? Yes, they did um, monitor the water quality in Kingsbury. And I, yeah, all of them. Kingsbury, Cream. Let me guess, and Wasaga. And do you know what they found? Has there been any change in water quality? It, yeah, it was um, pretty much like normal, what you would expect. Okay. Second question. So let's assume we've actually found cesium, and I'm not convinced of that yet, right? Where, what possibilities are there for sources of cesium for one sample? in one lake. We are not sure about that one, um, but further research um, could potentially um, give us an answer to that question. Yeah, it probably could, but you must have thought about it. What did you speculate? Because there's a few things that come to mind when I see cesium in a lake in Saskatchewan. Um, also, possibly like, I don't know, contamination um, from fisheries or we prepared the samples and there was also um, a few dams built in Kingsmere. So those are like, we didn't like speculate too much, but like those are just some like ideas we had. So did nobody mention the possibility of nuclear fallout? Um, no, we did not um, think about that possibility. Okay, thank you. And um, is that all the questions for today? 
No, I have a couple. I was just leaving some space in case there were questions from, from others. Uh, I don't have questions about your science. I have questions about your experience. So I thought I would wait to see if there were any science questions, more science questions. Okay, so my questions are about, uh, about your experience. Uh, as high school students, getting an opportunity to use a facility like the Canadian Light Source is a little bit rare. And um, I would like for uh, each of you to share with us um, something that you learned that you will take with you as you continue in high school or university or on to a career. I'm assuming you learned a little bit about spectroscopy and maybe trout and things like that. Um, but are there things that are personal to you that you've learned that, um, that you think will maybe help you along your way? Uh, this is more of like a, a core value, but I guess this experience really reinforced the value of uh, like teamwork because this could not have been possible without everyone here. So it really just showed how much you can't do everything alone. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta lean on someone and that's okay. And really what a team can do is it's incredible. In four days, we just, we did so much and it was really, it was a great experience. Um, I could honestly say the same as him, um, but on a more surface level, um, I honestly learned what autoliths are because I did not know <laughs> what they were before this. Um, I learned how rigorous the scientific process is. It was quite quite a lot of work, but yes, with this team, it was made it feel so much better. I just kind of learned that um, like more about the scientific process and that it like can take like a really long time and that you don't always find things immediately. Uh. I learned how important computers and technology are in science nowadays and how valuable, how valuable those skills are. Um, I also learned that like um, throughout these four days, we had like super long days. So it really made me realize how important it is to like actually like take brain breaks. Um, Probably the, the largest thing I learned was problem solving and also working around that, the difficulties that were thrown our way. Um, something I learned is that you're not always gonna get like a conclusive answer to the question you're asking and that's okay. Then you have to keep finding a way to figure that out. Are there still a couple more students? Yes, yeah. So how how, how important it is to uh, build up on the, the results that you found and to how you can continue to research and uh, figure more things out and uh, that all the steps of science are important. I learned about the importance of a good team work ethic. And I also learned a lot about um, how to process information and that uh, many times in science, there's a relationship between everything. So just because you get results in one thing, um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't correlate to other things as well. Okay, yeah, um, uh, that was everyone in our team. Okay, well, thank you. You guys did a spectacular job. I, it was, uh, I know that you worked really, really hard last week and over the weekend. And, and I just want you to know that it shows you did a really good job and that was a very good presentation. But I also don't wanna let uh, the teachers and your mentors off the hook either. I would actually like to invite um, Trent and Kristen and Bernie and Anna Maria and Gosha and James to comment on uh, what you may have learned over the last few days. I'll go first. Um, what I learned is that um, it does take a, a lot of effort and engagement in order to see 
um, and work through a scientific process like this virtually. Um, it is challenging, but it is rewarding at the end. So there is a lot of um, things to consider that may not have come to mind um, after doing this. Um, yeah, the virtual uh, experience was tough, but it was it was good in the end. We worked it all out. Um, for me, I think the hardest part or what I learned the most is as a teacher, we we really like to jump in. We like to help. We like to, I mean, be in control sometimes. And um, just that experience of really trying to step back and let the students take the lead and let them know that it's their project, not our project, because oftentimes you're sitting here and they're looking at you like, what do we do next? And it's like, I don't know. What do you do next? So for me, that was um, that was a really good learning experience to see what they can do when you just sort of let them do it. So that was for me. Yeah. And like this hasn't been the first time we've worked with a group that went to the CLS or worked with the CLS. And probably the most interesting part for me every time is that the, uh, the different dynamics within the groups and how everybody finds their, their different uh, sort of niche. And um, yeah, this, this group was different than other groups fantastic this the whole virtual experience was was substantially different but um but it all worked out really well in the end so it's all good thanks yes for myself again this is my very first uh student on a beamline experience so uh you guys have taught me so much and uh i could definitely I tried to create as much in-person connection in a virtual world uh, because physically I'm located in between both the Canadian Lights Arts and Prince Albert at the Carleton High School. So um, I definitely uh, got to learn a lot about how students start to communicate and, and watching you guys uh, starting to put your, your data together and, and how you were gonna present everything and just watching that growth um, from the first day to, to your presentation was just awesome. Like you guys did so much work. And for our first project to do virtually and to have two beam lines, it was like, wow, that was amazing. Uh, so you guys deserve a, a great kudos because you guys now not only just did one beam line, you worked on both uh, bio XAS imaging and idea. So for a first time go around, I learned a lot and I owe it all to you guys. So thank you very much. So I guess that <laughs> that leaves me. Um, so yeah, I think the one thing was that the virtual experience that was something, you know, that uh, we do have uh, remote users on the beam line, but it's a little bit, uh, you know, different because uh, with this group, you know, you, I mean, not this group, but with the students group, you know, you have to really, you know, you, you are teaching a little bit here. Yeah. So uh, usually they don't really have this uh, knowledge about the beam line in general, synchrotron and techniques. Uh, so I think I learned a little bit as well, you know, that uh, how to prepare better for the next group, if this group is also remote. But I think also, I mean, I think students would have to comment, you know, how they, actually how for them it was on bioaccess imaging, uh, the remote experience, because it was something, you know, from what was really important for me from the very beginning when we decided that it will be remote, uh, that you guys can still interact and do something yourself. Uh, I, I saw this as a value for you, but I would like to hear it. <laughs> If you agree, you know, uh, because it took a little bit of, uh, I guess, organization. Um, and, you know, not just with, with this group, but I think generally, uh, uh, I sort of, I always expect that you guys will do it and, and you do it, you know, and sometimes, you know, some people would say that for high school students, we, we simplify things and, oh my, I'm sorry, uh, but <laughs> actually I always believe that you guys can do it and, and you did it. Um, it was not mentioned in detail here, but the students actually, I, put them through paces of PIMCA proper full spectral analysis. So they analyzed, um, you know, the same way as we analyze actually spectrum by spectrum using PIMCA uh, and they did a great job. Uh, so I'm very proud of you guys uh, and yeah, <laughs> good job overall.
Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, and also thank you to Bernie for, you know, coming in person. And it is kind of difficult to doing everything online. So we could still have some like person to person connection. And also thank you, Gosha, for, um, you know, giving us, uh, letting us also experience what it would be like to use the BioXCS. Um, and then again, Anna Maria, um, for um, all your help and helpful feedback. Um, and yeah, we had a really great experience. Yeah, you did awesome. You did really good. Thank you.